with the Dave Show Midstream Reading Series. We're here. Oh, wow. My name is Richard Terrell. Uh, I'd like to start the way we always have and ask you to very briefly, in a sentence or less, maybe four words, uh, say your name and uh, your relationship to poetry, writer, reader, uh, uh, prose writer, administrator, teacher, uh, or whatever. Convicted felon, I don't know. <laughs> Some things, and, and so we'll just quickly go around the room. Would you like to start, please? Howdy, I'm uh, Frank Henson. I, I run a thing where uh, I compose music and combine it to with uh, poetry. Uh, Frank nice. Henson, uh, or it's over 500 of them up there. Oh. Jonathan, friend of Claire, who's reading today. <laughs> yep. Mimi, poet, host. Uh, I'm Amy. I'm a reader, writer, and teacher. Beth Spencer, poet, and reader. And I'm Bernie Lourdes. I'm a poet and a reader. Oh, Back tonight. <laughs> yeah, John's the enforcer, and it's his place, so we got to do what he says. Richard Terrell, I already said that. You weren't listening, John. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to do that. Uh, Papa John, I wanted because I wanted to thank uh, Papa John Colstead, who owns this great space, which is midstream. And uh, would you like to say a word? Well, that's a silly question. Of course you would. Please. Well, I, I do have, I have some things. First of all, thank you. We, this this place has been under construction for about nine months. Mm -hmm. The stairway has been completely redone. Uh, it was a major, major job, and there are a number of other things we've done. We had some roof leaks and had repairs and ceiling problems and whatnot. All fixed, but there was a mess left behind of dust and debris. And Richard kind of came uh, yesterday and spent most of the day. Was it yesterday? Uh, it feels like it was a week. A week ago. <laughs> uh, to help clean it all up. So uh, he can tell you that this is a major change from what it was. Mm -hmm. Only a few hours ago. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you. This is what we really wanted it to be uh, be like. A couple of things about housekeeping: there, the light back there is the way to the bathroom, and it's to the left. As almost everything here is to the left, uh, <laughs> and the stairway to go out is to the right of that. So people often go into the bathroom trying to get out. So it's just a different for winder. So those are about all the things that I have to say, and welcome everybody. I'm glad to be back live. Thanks for having me. Uh, if you're not on our email list, uh, I have a sign-up sheet. 
just pass this around or you can also go to the website midstream reading series dot wordpress dot com right now we can they can sign up there as well but this is convenient if you're right especially if you're a first time visitor do we have a pen on there no I got the other thing we forgot I forgot to tell three of our readers that there will be books for sale over there I see Brian Brian put some there but I'm sure right after you're done we're done you can scoot over and put a few books there if you if you'd like to peruse the books of our tonight's readers and I remind you as I've done in the past of the immortal words of the poet Kenneth that Kenneth Hatchin who famously said people who say they like poetry and never buy any are cheap sons of bitches so 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 keep that in mind I just want to recognize Paul Maddie's who got us through the zoom era if you join us on zoom and is recording this tonight for our website so I get to read home and as I stand here I haven't decided which one this is from my book came out last fall what falls away is always poems and conversations I read this is a poem by John Coltrane and all you need to know is that he died at age 40 and the poem part of the poem posits what he might have done had he lived longer Coltrane he liked to laugh didn't smile on album covers only because his teeth were bad. Once there were so many waiting in line, he took tickets at his own gig so the doorman could catch a break to pee. He was shy, and if you weren't, he just agreed with you. Journalists came away writing about themselves. He said, sometimes I wish I could walk up to my music as if I had never heard it before. He asked, did you like it? Did you really think I played well? <laughs> Imagine him among the galaxies like light bending gently through time. Einstein knew about that early but kept it to himself. Or imagine him earthbound, breathing the very air you later would. Then see him instead, almost 90, tending his garden hoeing red potatoes, sweet as kept promises, dragging his rusted implements, lacquer worn away to essential beauty, gently over the loose soil, which is also sweet to the small animals living there and who can hear him hum in the cord's upper structure. See him, maybe, leave the yard still too soon as if it didn't matter, as if all the world weren't there. Our first reader, wow, where he <laughs> Brian Satram grew up in Oregon, Germany, California, and England. He's the author of the poetry collection Starting Again, published by Finishing Line Press in 2020. His poems have appeared in a variety of journals, including Cider Press Review, The Laurel Review, Poetry Northwest, Rattle, and Tab, which nominated his work for a Pushcart Prize. He has also published book reviews at Mayday Magazine and Colorado Review. He attended McAllister College in St. Paul and completed an MFA at the University of Maryland College Park, where he studied with one of my classmates. After living for extended periods in Madison, Wisconsin, and Los Angeles, he now makes his home in Minneapolis. His web website is briansatram.com. Brian. I have so much enjoyed being in the audience uh, uh, for this reading series via Zoom. Um, um, and uh, that helped me get through the last year. Um, I have to say the ambiance here is, is, is a lot nicer. I like it. <laughs> and I uh, really appreciate um, being invited to be a part of this in-person uh, reading. I, I want to thank Richard for inviting me and uh, um, the other hosts for um, organizing such a wonderful reading series. So thank you. And I am going to read from 
my collection starting again it's my first poetry collection it came out almost exactly a year ago and I'm going to read I'm going to start with the first poem in the collection you might want to imagine yourself in a little two-room nature center at the top of a hiking trail in the Los Angeles area and the poem is called witness I'm looking for the rattlesnake which sits there coiled and dark but the revelation is the gopher snake shedding its skin in the next terrarium a gradual easing out of its sheath as if by power of concentration what's left behind brittle textured an impression when I step through the doors of the nature center into the Sun my eyes need a moment to adjust then I run to catch up with you you and your sister already starting down the sandy trail into the Arroyo I don't feel different except for a sense of lightness from what I've seen about 30 years ago I was uh, really uh, sick with an extremely virulent form of pneumonia it nearly took me out I was on a ventilator it was not a, a fun time this next poem relates to that experience it, so it's not a COVID poem it's not a pandemic poem but I, I, I do have to say that that the pandemic has brought back some of these memories uh, so I thought I'd share this with you it's called after effects I assumed it was just the flu before it emerged three days later as if from the shadow of my assumption to make itself apparent needing me for that to tighten its grip around my chest hurting no strength in my lungs my fist pounded against the wall an improvised voice to draw attention a condensed sense of space the red scar the surgeons left on my right side starts down from my shoulder blade a line a child could have drawn with a stick in fresh cement in a casual tone as if giving me brief operating instructions for a new purchase he's telling me to massage it to help it heal the question I don't know how to phrase because the thought seems more superstitious than real isn't about what's been cut out or the physical after effects but what's unseen any dark matter the opening up of my body's let in a number of the poems in this collection are about not having children so um, this is one of those and it's called with time I'm the one to hollow the pumpkin and carve a face the doorbell rings again you adore the children tonight in their costumes a warm night we have no costumes just the two of us and the space between forming a shape we keep repeating my turn to go and hand out candy we finally threw away the photo from the booth that merged our faces a composite to show what a daughter of ours might look like she looked freaky not being real this isn't yours alone to carry isn't your failure we won't let us drift apart but there's nothing 
to work on or figure out with time you'll say your body doesn't crave being a mother anymore you can't say it now your silence a place into which I don't know how to follow you um, I, I, I traveled a lot uh, both as a kid growing up and then uh, as an adult uh, with my wife Lee and lived in a lot of different places so a number of the poems in the collection are reflections back on those places they may actually be physically going back to visit those places or just reflecting on them and, and those poems often uh, out of the corner of my eye I'm also noticing maybe a little disconnect of one kind uh, or another so this this poem is one of those uh, uh, it's about Madison any of you spent any time in Madison Wisconsin um, the poem is called from within Lake Monona Madison Wisconsin Acolytes of the sluggish, muggy dark. There are dozen or so rods, the tip of one dipping into the still water. Crowded around a spot where a street runoff empties into the lake. Black and Hmong anglers casting from shore, some sitting on large plastic buckets, and white anglers from aluminum boats they brought in close. A ball game on a radio, bobbers with lights like fireflies above the surface, though fireflies don't hover above surfaces or bob, but trace part of an arc like a match as it's tossed away. Otis Redding's plane went down here on the way to his next show. I doubt he knew the name of the lake, his thoughts, other places, when he traveled. If you walk this path certain times of day, you'll notice a loon close enough to see the red in its eye. Strange, in the reflection of a power plant, of four tall smokestacks and a city skyline. Have you caught a fish of any kind? From within that stillness, you feel a tug. At first, you're not sure what it is. Your heart thumping in your chest. Other poems in here uh, take place in grocery stores, and I <laughs> joke that I'm uh, not sure whether there's uh, something about the setting of a grocery store like an existential question I'm trying to resolve or if it was just that I was hungry when I wrote these poems uh, uh, but uh, this is one of those and it's called Sparrow if this were a pond and she stood still in it she'd be an egret but she's all small calculated moves. Her green cashmere sweater, 20 something youth, shoulder length blonde hair, headed for the free sample of blue corn tortilla chips and guacamole, then clutching a fistful of red unwashed grapes, one bulging in her cheek. At the self-serve island of the deli section, black plastic tongs in hand, she drops into the hollow of her palm three wedges of potato sautéed in rosemary, barely stopping while she flits without basket or cart among shoppers, practiced in this space, hunting up what's to be found along peripheries of vision, as if it were fallen seed in the shadows of a tree-lined drive leading to a great estate. Then she's gone, having managed a small meal of it without purchase or commotion, 
a glass door shutting behind her like a sleepy eye. This next poem is called The Way Things Come Together. I wonder who the limousine is for, the one below with headlights on in the middle of an empty parking lot. Why the bar with stools in this otherwise ordinary hotel room? With someone else, a friend, I could joke about it, make it a topic of conversation, how it gives the place a 50s feel. My copy of Whitman beside the bed seems lost, not just the worn paperback on a spotless glass table, but the poems inside, the sweep of them, what's brought together there. I could joke about the salesman at the, me at the meeting I flew here for, their polo shirts, cologne, after dinner drinks, cigars, but that would be smug. They seemed all right, they seemed to know themselves, their place. I've always told myself I'll live in the present, watch, listen for patterns, the way things come together, though often nothing happens. And then I'll finish up with the um, title poem to the collection. And again, thank you so much for having me, and thank you uh, uh, for being a wonderful and attentive audience. And this is this has actually meant quite a bit to me after uh, after this last year to be here with you. So thank you. <clears throat> Starting again. The moon grows fuller from right to left, and it's spreading darkness too, later in the month from right to left. Things I'm discovering. The sun came up this morning in the glass of downtown, and for a moment I thought of all of us as windows of flame before the sky dulled again. You're quieter, having a harder time just being, though there's nothing out of the ordinary to point to, maybe because. And I'm not helping much. A transplant from LA, enamored of the Midwest, you always find ways to celebrate the seasons, picking up a red leaf from the sidewalk, placing it as a centerpiece on the dining room table. I give you a kiss on the mouth as a way of avoiding answering your question. You asked what I was doing when I got out of bed last night to jot down a note in pencil. I was starting again, seeing what I can piece together by naming one thing I know, so later I can add to it another. Thank you so much. That was Brian Satron. Claire Womanholm is the author of Night Vision from New Michigan Press 2017, Wilder from Milkweed Editions 2018, Red Mouth from Tinderbox Editions 2019, and the forthcoming Meltwater Milkweed Editions 2023. Her work has most recently appeared in or is forthcoming from Ninth Letter, Blackbird, Washington Square Review, Good River Review, Descant, Copper Nickel, and Beloit Poetry Journal. She is a 2020-2021 McKnight Fellow and lives in the Twin Cities. Find her online at clairewomanholm.com.
That was really lovely, Brian. That was awesome. Um, hi, this is my first uh, in-person reading in like two years, maybe. Um, so I'm like very grateful um, to be here among y'all in this really excellent space. Is this like, is this sound tinny to anyone else? No, okay, it's just me. Great, perfect. Um, thank you so much to Richard for inviting me to read here, um, and thanks to Brian and Chris and Matt for sharing your like work um, and letting me be a part of that. Um, so I'll read a little bit from Wilder. Um, it's pronounced Wilder because, of course, no, there's no reason you should know that. It looks like Wilder. Why would you think it's Wilder? It's me being pedantic. Um, Wilder is in the Wilder. Um, it's, there's, there's, yeah, there's no reason you should know that. Um, so I'll read a little bit from Wilder, a little bit from Redbath, but then mostly um, stuff from my third book, um, Meltwater, and then maybe, maybe one that is even part of book four, which I'm working on now. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so one of the core elements of Wilder is this sequence of um, erasures that I did of Carl Sagan's book Cosmos, um, which is like a foundational text for me, and maybe also for you, if you have excellent mm -hmm. taste. Um, <laughs> but there are nine, so I took, they're mostly erasures from the first chapter of that book, which is called The Shores of the Cosmic Ocean. Um, and I just looked, took pages of that and pulled out, you know, words that seemed especially um, interesting to me. And they made nine little poems that I kind of scattered across the book. Um, and if you read them kind of, you know, back to back, they make their own sort of like sci-fi little adventure narrative. Um, and I've never done that. And, you know, I've read from Wilder a lot since it was published a couple, you know, three, three, oh my gosh, yeah, three years ago. Um, Four, three, you're right. Three, okay. I was like, four. I mean, it's been a while. Okay, scared me. Sure. I mean, the pan, it does, does, you know, time doesn't really mean anything anymore, so I can't remember. Um, but I've never read, so I'm always trying to think of, like, ways to kind of get into this book and, like, read stuff from it, but I've never read all the erasures just, like, back to back. So that's what I'll do. Um, and they don't have titles, but you'll be able to tell when the poems are starting and stopping. The ocean calls. We cross six trillion miles of everlasting night. We are precious tendrils of light. We may be a sun to someone. Why should we be utterly lost? The dark is everywhere, it is a confusion. We are profoundly lonely, a reed in the sea. We had a taste for error and frail boats. O oh, ye brave sailors in an unexplored sky. We strayed from home and failed utterly on the shores of space. An alien general collected us in a dank and forgotten library consecrated to mold. The scholars of the library studied and mapped us. Robots compiled the dead in large dissecting rooms. We were disintegrated, pathetic scattered fragments. On the library shelves, a book. The tragedy of our wonder was in it. In a flash of light, I made myself a road, an earth in slow atoms, no limit, no future. The world is very distant. We know the humdrum immensity of space. We know that our universe is merely a glimpse of the end. Men wander among us, fierce, a great many. We are surrounded by 10,000 large animals who hunt in packs. Our generations become extinct. We grow up frozen like icy moons. Our brothers and sisters are giant snowballs. Every now and then, the ice is vaporized by an inferno of light. This is the last one. At the end, we turn blue beyond imagining. We are in pain. No soft meadows here, but our search for them is long, longest. 
At the bottom of a deep well, we cast no shadow. So that's one thread that kind of like weaves through um, this book. I have a couple of copies over there. If you want to see what's going on outside of that, um, that sort of sequence, um, it's not better. It's not more uplifting. I mean, it's all, it's, it's like that. So if you want to read it for not more uplifting stuff, great, it is the book for you. Um, so, um, let's see, I'll read a couple from Red Mouth. Now, space and time are like endlessly fascinating, um, she said in the hugest understatement ever. Um, but both Wilder and Red Mouth draw a lot from kind of the mathematical and astronomical sublime, um, and they use kind of a lot of that um, imagery. So we'll read two shortish ones from Red Mouth um, that pick up on some of the same stuff as that erasure sequence, but in a different way. Um, the first one is called Null, as in like a null set, you know, etc. Null. If gravity is a yield, is the falling into of a field, if of sunflowers, if I am pulled into their orbits with heavy-headed hunger, with urge, if curvature, if a million mirrors mirror the suns I bury myself among, if I am uprooted and reflung toward the sun face first, if perihelion, if my faith to the field is uncertain as a hawk's flight from a lureless glove, if so, let me flutter between these two surfaces of sun in an endless catch and fall. Let my face burn, bereaving, wherever I turn. Um, and the second one is called Given, um, and it starts with an epigraph from Euclid's um, Elements, which I think was like 300 BCE or something, right? Um, and the uh, epigraph is, um, a point is that which has no part. A given is always a point of departure, a puncture, origin of a wound, some newness. For example, this given that points are partless when really they're couple numbered, binary, the way no matter how fast it flies, a blue bird's blue can never outstrip its bird or butter drain from its cup, rattle shed its snake. What would it do that bird, unblue, unselled, blanched on winter's branch, absent against its white? Without you, I'm only the idea of flight. So that's Red Mouth. It's a little bit more romantic. It's got more um, kind of pastoral imagery in there. Um, and so in, um, in Meltwater, the newest book, I have this series of um, glacier poems. They're all called Glacier. There are four or five of them. Um, and they're sort of a futuristic, hopefully, speculative, hopefully, um, and they take place in an era of what you might call like glacier tourism, right? Like mm -hmm. where there are only a handful of glaciers left, um, and some of them are in the wild, and some of them have been installed indoors in these like museum kind of vault-like environments, etc. Um, so I'll read one from kind of the middle of that series, and then I'll read the, the very last one in the series. Mm -hmm. Glacier. Zero degrees. We signed waivers agreeing to keep our mouths closed. No yawning, which would raise the temperature of the vault. No coughing. I imagined ice cream, ice water, icicles in my throat. I tried to slow my heart rate by imagining waves on the open ocean, the energy orbiting deeply through a packet of water before setting it down again. The walls of the vault were curved like a planetarium's, holding together a sky so blue and bright it was depthless, yearless. The bergs were so blue and bright they looked like raspberry shave ice. They sat behind bomb-proof glass, cored and carved down to their frozen hearts. I wanted to fill my eyes with them. I wanted to be solemn and surprised by how easy that was, how small and neat they were on their velvet-draped pedestals, grouped by country of extraction. Each was named for the first man to put his boots on it, Hubbard, Moreno, Franz Joseph, Lambert. A wave rose and sank on the ocean. I tried to let these facts build something useful and sad in my brain, but everything was a slush of anxiety. Like reading about wars, the hostile parties, the early invasions, the dates bleeding and bleeding into each other. Everything was made of the same material, the same pressure, crest and trough. Even now we were in a war I didn't know the name of. Even now bombs were falling above ground. It made sense for us to be hiding down here together. 
the placards mentioned repatriation, but I knew that when it was over, we would not be reunited with our pillaged, melted bodies. A glass of water will not freeze around an ice cube. The bird calls looped and looped. The artificial pine mist stung my eyes, but I kept them open. I imagined waves on the ocean. Maybe we would be renamed for the first things our eyes touched when we resurfaced. Snowdrop, reindeer moss, fjord. I wanted to be ready for whatever was left of the world. Um, this one, this last one in the series, also called Glacier, obviously, right? Um, and the only thing you really need to know here is toward the beginning, um, there are some approximations of the depth of water that would result from all the exist existing glaciers if they all melted at once, um, like how deep that would be. It'll make sense when we get there, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Glacier. It is everywhere. It is the water I am trying to teach my daughters to float in. It is the sky I tell them to keep their eyes on. It is the air I tell them to seal in their mouths should they slip underwater. I am a leaky boat, but I am trying to answer their questions. As deep as 30 Christmas trees, as deep as 20 giraffes standing on each other's backs. There hasn't been a sea here for 75 million years. I cannot explain that number. My daughter's ankles are sinking into the barrel water. No one can float forever. On the map, pushpins skewer patches of icy green like rare moths. I am trying to say it's too late without making them too sad. It's like how you can't take the blue out of the white paint, like how you can't hear your name and not turn around. The calving of glaciers is the loudest underwater sound on Earth. I dip my daughter's ears beneath the surface to let them listen. It's like how you can't put a feather back on a bird, like how the bird won't fit back into its shell. We step backward into the house. I wring the glacier out of their suits. I wring it out of their hair. I wipe it from their faces, but it is everywhere. It is the storm, it is the drowned harbor, it is the current, it is the bath water the baby slurps before we can stop her. The horizon rises, it rains. The glacier hammers the roof, the glacier soaks a corner of the bedroom ceiling, which grains with spores. On the map, the pushpins hover over green air. The green air is a spreading shroud. The storm surges ashore, mercurial and summer smelling. We are not accustomed to the sea, so we describe it like a sky. The waves are tornado green and loud. In the water, the polar bears look like clouds. Hmm. Hmm. Um, let me see. I, um, I really like working with poems in a series, obviously. Um, I have a lot of different series going on. Um, but the longest running one I have is this series of um, alphabet poems that I started in, again, time doesn't mean anything, maybe 2016. Um, so in Wilder, there's um, a B, a D, a G, and a W. In Meltwater, there's M, O, P, and X, Y, Z. And in Book 4, which doesn't have a title yet, there's a, an E and a Q. Um, but I'll read P here, um, which is coming up in Meltwater. Um, and if you don't know what I mean by alphabet poem, it'll be very obvious in like ju just a second here. P. P is for picture book. The pillow at our backs, Pooh and Piglet on an expedition to the North Pole, my daughter in her Peppa Pig pajamas. The pressure on my windpipe is supposed to be unwrapping itself. P is for peace, or peace lily, or peace rose, or even peach. P is not for the Permian Basin and its pipelines and petrochemical plants. Not for pangolin, not for pandemic. Picture the pika's pitter-patter, or Peter Rabbit is placing his shoes among the potatoes, going lippity-lippity through the parsley. <laughs> P is for peekaboo, for this little piggy. I open plip-plop ponds, flash-spun polyethylene pages, and point to the polywogs and lily pads. I pretend the phosphorus is not proliferating, the pH is not plunging. I flip to Paddington, perched politely outside the lost property office, and try not to picture the cruise ships pumping sewage into Peruvian ports. I try to picture Polynesia, Papua New Guinea, Papaete, without the Pacific princess plying the waters. P is for pufferfish and porcupine fish, I say. P is for plague ship. P is for Point Nemo, where a deprogrammed spacecraft plummet like Phaeton, pinwheel into smaller and smaller rain, pepper the waves with photocells and paint chips. Around it, the garbage patch pearls its plastics, the pieces smaller than plum pits, smaller than pixels, pinpricks, plankton. Once P is for plastic, it is always for plastic. I open each peach pear plum to spy it hidden in the ptarmigan, the pheasant, in the thallow blue of the Portuguese man of war. I read The Princess and the Pea and swear I can feel the pellets in each layer of the ocean, 
epipelagic, mesopelagic, past where light penetrates into the bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, where scientists have found polyester in the molten putty between the Pacific and Philippine plates. I see a baby beluga and see pods of pilot whales with pool floaties pretzeled inside their pelvic cavities. I see the polybezoar is packed inside the camel's guts. P is for the pelt of plastic growing over the Pearl River. Pontoons of polar spring propel in Panama blue bottles. Bottles that once held the pills we take to make ourselves feel less like prey. The Purell bottles more permanent than permafrost. I turn the page, but it's a palindrome of panic. The petrol preens petroleum from its plumage. The propeller pulps the back of the porpoise. My daughter has slipped into sleep. I place her outside my arms parenthesis so she, so she can't feel my pulse pounding. P is her parachute, I whisper across the placenta of her dreaming. P is her pearl, penicillin, picnic, planetarium, platypus, plank, the pocket-sized pipistrelle, the ponderosa, and its pine beetles. I turn up the pink noise on her sound machine so she can't hear that P is also the end of chirp, tulip, kelp, scallop, ice cap, sleep. Um, thank you. And the alphabet poems are really fun to read, too. They're really fun. Um, this is the last one I'll do. Um, actually, I only have two sort of like pandemic poems, one of which is this alphabet poem um, that I'll finish with, Q. Um, and the alphabet poems are fun for many reasons, but I learned a lot about the words that I've been using like fairly casually um, for however many years. Um, quash, for example, to me meant like, oh, like to suppress or to stifle something, but it literally is like to utterly obliterate or pulverize or crush into a fine powder. Um, quell, which I usually also use to mean like a kind of a gentle suppression or a stifling, um, means like to slaughter or to put to death, actually. Um, and qualm, which we use now to be like, oh, I like to feel like a slight misgiving, actually means like a violent death, a widespread pestilence or plague, calamity or a disaster. Um, so Q is on the one hand like kind of a quirky letter, but also very sinister, far more sinister than I thought. Um, and I've never read this one out loud, which is fun. It has no real punctuation besides long dashes. And I used a random number generator set between one and five to determine how many words would appear between each dash. Because um, at least to me, like so much of the last 18 months have felt random and unhinged and claustrophobic and uncontrollable and disorienting and full of interruption and time and pacing have been irrelevant. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of how best to read the poem aloud so you can actually kind of hear the dashes. I think I'm going, I think I'm going to breathe at every dash. So I hope I don't pass out. <laughs> if I, someone come up here, if I like start to like, anyway, um, but thank you for being like such a lovely audience, much love, etc. <laughs> Q. Quick, what quakes like an aspen? Quakes like quarry, like each in the porcupine's quiver of quills, like each of the queen's quivering wings. Time, coquettes and quirks. It is the quilt of quack grass, the uncooperative quartz, the quince quartered and quartered and quartered again down to the quantum quarantine. Felt queasy like this, how quaint the quiet time Quadrupling, I quashed the quail eggs into quiche, cut it into quadrants again and again, down to its quiddity, a quadrillion crumbs, like and not, like the sequestering of eight billion, into ones, ones, ones. I practiced my quick breads and quick knits, drank my quarts of quarantinis, stomach the quipped, clapped for the outdoor quartets, time quick silver, then quintupled, those of us who lived, lived quasi-quelled, quasi-well. The qualm blazes like a quasar which dies by quenching all of its galaxy's stars. That was Claire Womanholm. Chris Stark is a native Ashinaabe and Cherokee award-winning writer, researcher, visual artist, and national speaker. Her second novel, Carnival Lights, is about missing and murdered indigenous women. Her first novel, Nichols, A Tale of Dissociation, was a Lambda Literary finalist. Her essays, poems, academic writing, and creative nonfiction have appeared in numerous publications, including 
the Palgrave International Handbook on Trafficking, University of Pennsylvania Law Review, Dignity Journal, the WIP, Florida Review, the Chalk Circle Intercultural Prize-Winning Essays, When We Become Weavers, Queer Female Poets on the Midwest Experience, Hawk and Handsaw, the Journal of Creative Sustainability, mm. and many others. Her poem, Mama's Song, was recorded by Fred Ho and the Afro-Asian Music Ensemble as a double manga CD. <laughs> That's a great sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Chris teaches writing at Central Lakes Community College. She has an MFA in writing and an MSW. More information, christinestark.com. I dealt with the pandemic by not going anywhere for a year and a half, so this whole wearing the mask thing was really terrible for me. <laughs> I'm like, how do people do that? I just made it 20 minutes. I feel like I have a nervous breakdown. Um, so anyway, uh, I also discovered when I got in the room that I couldn't see, so April kindly ran out and found these um, readers for me, which now I can see. That's really helpful. Um, <laughs> I want to just thank everyone for coming here, uh, taking time out, for uh, hosting us in this room that I want to just sit in for like three hours and look at because it's <laughs> really, really interesting, everything in here. Thank you, um, Dick and uh, the other hosts uh, for bringing me in. I'm the, you know, prose reader, so I'm the <laughs> one that you're all going to be like, hey, <laughs> 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 up to the next poetry. will be up soon. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's, it's also kind of, it's, it's really nice, too, because um, this book, Carnival Lights, just, just came out like a month ago, and so this is um, the first in-person reading, which is really lovely, and I want to be really optimistic and think that um, in a month from now, we'll still be meeting in person. Let's just think that way. <laughs> and ignore the headlines. So, um, uh, yeah, anyway, this is set in 1969, and it's... Um, Two teenage Ojibwe cousins. Ojibwe and Anishinaabe are the same, same people. And um, I come from the Anishinaabe and the Cherokee and uh, some other uh, uh, countries as well over there in Europe. And they leave their their fictitious reservation for the big city lights of Minneapolis. Um, a lot of the end of the story takes place at the state fair. If there's any state fair fans, I happen to be a huge one. Um, but I'm going to start about page 90 here. And we're going to start with uh, their aunt, their auntie M. Virginia, Minnesota, July 1969. M knew how to be still. She knew how not to cry out. In Virginia, the summer that the white men put dusty boot prints on the moon's face, M waited for the scratchings. She studied the door in the narrow, tiny room with one small window face level, that is, if she were able to stand. Formerly a girl servant's bedroom. It had just enough room for a body to lie prone with a foot-deep chest of drawers. The dolls were long since absent, but the metal racks were still drilled into the walls. Em thought of her mother, how the only time she cried out was when the hardest stories were told. She cried out about the one when six squalling Indian babies were taken from Fond du Lac on their way to an orphanage in Cincinnati and were tossed overboard into Lake Superior off a grain cargo headed to Toledo. So the story went. Something went wrong, according to the breed who reported the story to his relatives. He had been working the ship. He didn't know why, just that the ship's captain ordered a first mate to throw the Indian babies into the icy water two miles out from Duluth. View for ship first, the Scottish captain had said in his broken English. Be of utmost positive actions, not viewed. Wait two miles. He held up two fingers. Two, then, and he made a dumping movement with his arms. However, the Scottish captain told the one and only Slav working a ship in America, who knew virtually no English, and mistook his two fingers to mean two minutes. The Slav waited five minutes, as he thought it was strange to do this in full sight of the lighthouse. <laughs> Yet orders were orders, was what he'd been taught, and still in view of the white lighthouse on the rock, the Slav tossed the infants one by one into the frothy waters of Lake Superior, the lake the size of Austria, whose temperatures never rose above 55 degrees at the surface. Across the way, the lighthouse attendant witnessed what appeared to be sacks of flowers being tossed into the waters. But upon closer inspection with his government-issued binoculars, he saw what he believed to be the bald head and arms of an infant whose sack came loose. 
He told his wife, who told her sister, who passed it down the generations until decades later, a descendant saw an article in the Duluth Tribune while sipping cold-pressed coffee one sunny August morning in 2013 on the screaming gull's patio that overlooked the giant shimmering lake. <clears throat> the article said Indian women and babies had been sold on the ships <clears throat> for decades, and because growing up she'd heard the stories of what her great-great-great-grandfather saw, she believed it. The breed Indian on the ship did and said nothing when he'd realized they were going to throw the Indian babies into the icy lake. He pretended he did not understand, turned his back to the captain and first mate, and went on deck to smoke with the other breeds on board. <clears throat> Later, when he told other Indians, no one asked what he did. Everyone knew what would have happened. He would have joined the infants in their Friday deathbed, perhaps dragged to the bottom by the lake monster, a terrible way to die because of the spirits in the Great Lake. Em was young when she first heard that story, visiting relatives out in the bush. Her nieces, Sharon Kristen, just babies, lay sleeping next to her, their hot bodies tangled together, their breasts making soft white clouds in the chilled room. Em's cry alerted her mother and auntie that she'd heard. Her cry pushed their talk to a cousin's eighth grade son who'd made the Antwantons high school track team. That boy can run, Em's auntie said, and then moved to the blanket, quick as a shadow, and pulled it back a bit to look in on the girls. A wing of fire flickered across the curved wall. Em shut her eyes, but a moment before her aunt peered through the narrow opening. The baby stirred, but did not wake. Em's auntie returned to the bucket of potatoes they were peeling for the week. They shook their heads. Six Indian babies, Em's mother said. Em's auntie shook her head no. There was no point in thinking on it. Em's auntie's thoughts on that subject ended. But Ethel's thoughts on it did not end. She did not know how to make them stop. She dropped her head and sucked back tears, as she did not want to show more emotion. The knife and yellow potato flesh bur blurred, and blood, sh blood smudged the skin of the next potato she picked. Em listened to Sharon Chris's sweet exhales, felt the innocence and love that surrounded them. She'd cared for them like a mother, a big sister, an auntie. Em turned onto her belly and wrapped one arm around the girls, listening to their breath, to the murmurings of her family in the other room, to the beat of her heart pounding through the thin blankets into the cold, hard earth. On the floor in Virginia, years after the story about the six babies, her body pressed against the cold, hard floor, and thought of her people, shipped off, stolen, sold, traded, their bodies poisoned by disease, so many dead. M hardened herself. She must survive to get back to the girls, especially Chris, her sister's motherless child. She sealed off the pain of a broken cheekbone, she prepared herself to be sold off. She would not cry out. And so now we're um, jumping forward about a month that same year, and Cher and Chris uh, have met up with um, Jacob, um, and they are, that's where we're going to now. They're down in Minneapolis. The girls and boys, the girls and boy huddled next to the cement outcropping. Cher lay on her side, the heat from the cement against her back. The stems of the grasses in front of her, all around her, were enlarged. They grew into trees in a forest, her perception altered from the contact high. She traveled among them, enormous white pines, whorled red oaks, slim cedars, low-slung low ferns, each individual leaf moving like the smooth-skinned neon green caterpillars that drop from the treetops every spring and summer back home. On the farm, the res, her <coughs> family, her people, Cher sure felt she was falling. She grabbed the weeds and pulled, cutting her hands. Kristen murmured and moved in her sleep, at odds with the demons her father planted in her. The boy made a yelping sound, and then another low moan as he twisted too sharply in his, in his sleep, setting off the pain in his ribs. Cher listened to them as she studied her hands in the moonlight. She had her grandmother's fingers and thumbs, broad nails and double-jointed. Her grandmother was with her, in her, part of her, and her grandmother's grandmother. They lived in her, and Chris through them both. The weeds were thick and tough and scaly like the ones on the farm. The memory of their grandmothers, the weeds, calmed her, rooted her. Cher wiped her hands on her jeans, remembered her mother's advice about doing laundry, about how blood stains are hard to get out, so you should avoid washing them in warm water. Her mother, with whom she'd never been close. Her father said her mother had changed drastically from being around those church people in Antwaten, but Cher never remembered her being any other way. Cher placed the palms of her hands on the slanted cement outcropping, leaving an outline of her hands in blood. 
Warm and flat is what shares mine registered. Warm and flat. The other two yelping in their sleeps like whelping pups. And Cher's mother at home, on the farm, as she had returned after Cher's father died. Cher left a note under Cher's pillow so that her mother would not see it for a few days. Maybe think she was at Chris's. I have to leave. Cher. She could imagine her mother telling her childhood friend Wanda or her cousins when she ran into them at the grocery store. Cold. That girl was always cold. Nothing normal about a girl so cold towards her own mother. A girl so like a boy. The listing early morning rush hour traffic woke Cher. The shock of her surroundings hit her like a bucket of cold water. Kristen slept below her and the boy above her. One of her boots lay on its side in the, we in the weeds. The sky was gray and sunless. Cher studied the large church to the right, its spires three stories high and tapered like a medieval sword, and the string of storefronts in front of her, the squat brick apartment buildings to the left. She had nothing to do and nowhere to go. No chores, no school, no home, no bed. Chris stirred. Cher smelled her armpits and sank back down, stinking worse than a day after bailing hay in the hot sun. You get used to it, Jacob said behind her. Suppose. You Indians don't talk very much, do you? Jacob yawned. Guess not, Cher said. <laughs> Chris woke. You're country girls, that's easy to see. Jacob sat up and twisted his ribs. Ow, shit, he grabbed at his side. You're prime property out here, do you know that? Cher studied the scratches on her hands that had blood so ferociously the night before. Her silence made Jacob angrier. You dog meat out here, he blurted, lapsing into how his Brooklyn Jewish grandparents said you. It's always good when your enemy underestimates you, Chris said. She'd read about wars and liked to imagine herself a warrior. Her grandfather encouraged her reading and flights of fantasy by telling wartime tales of his own. She would read about a general strategy and then tell her grandfather. She would smoke, listen intently, adding in a oh and a ah on occasion. When she finished, she'd say, oh yeah, good story, my girl. Say, that reminds me, this one time 20 or even 30 Germans, but maybe even more, as you know it was a long time ago, came up over the hill early one morning, smelling so bad like sauerkraut, stinky cabbage, their round little helmets too big on their heads and bobbing around so they looked like birds pecking at food. You know how that was. I jumped up, all alone, just me, because the rest of the regiment sound asleep. The sky there was all gray. There wasn't any green grass or trees for as far as you could see. Just gray. Everything was about death over there. No life at all. And then those krauts were about to bayonet us all. And since I didn't have time to wake anyone, I let out my secret Indian war whoop that I patented with the government right when I got called up. I got the papers right here. And he'd pat the breast pocket of his cotton shirt. That was the first thing I did because, you know, if you know how the government steals, maybe here, and he'd pat his back jean pocket. Oh, well, it's somewhere around here. Paper, you know how important that is. Anyway, I, when I find it, I will show it to you. So when I saw those bird heads coming my way, I yelled, ay 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 ay, and off those krauts ran back where they came from, probably all the way to Berlin, because we never seen them again. He stuffed a corncob pipe with more tobacco and lit up, a white man's pipe, as he called them, and then I became the U.S. government's best-kept secret weapon. He paused and puffed out smoke rings. The government stunk me from camp to camp to let loose on enemy eardrums my patented war whoop. He pointed the stem at Chris. But you will never read about me in any book, my girl. He blew more smoke rings, studied his granddaughter, who was mesmerized by his story, her eyes glassy and distant from the scene she saw in her mind. Top secret, he set the pipe on his knee. Books, my girl, are okay. They tell good stories, but there's always more to it than what they got written in them. Thank you for your time. Expenses associated with this endeavor, taxes, utilities, the air conditioning being uh, refurbished. So, if you're of a mind and can afford something, please consider uh, chipping in for this space, John. Uh, I neglected to point out to everybody, we have had a clock here for many years. And for the last four years, it has diligently and deliberately stayed exactly the same time. <laughs> but I have found a new clock that actually keeps the time. So 
uh, <laughs> something I neglected to point out to everybody. So they kept looking at the clock and thinking that their reading was going slowly. <laughs> uh, but now it's actually very, I've been clocking it since uh, I put it up there, and it's exactly the same as myself. I, I did notice that the clock wasn't in, it was moving. It wasn't yeah. not moving. <laughs> and while you have your wallets out, I'll remind you that there are books for sale on that table, and I'm sure the, uh, their authors would be happy to uh, sign them for you. Um, and um, I want to invite you, after the reading, to join us at Merlin's Rest, if you're of a mind for uh, a drink. Uh, kitchen's open till 10. It's two blocks west on Lake Street, uh, and we specialize in lively conversation, which is something I miss as much as poetry, mm -hmm. and these readings in, in the last uh, year and a half. So we'll be at Merlin's, stop by if, if you can. Our last reader is Matt Mauck, the author of four poetry collections, including 2021's We're the Flown Over, We Come from Flyover Land, <coughs> Bird Brain, and If You're Lucky is a Theory of Mine, as well as the chapbook, The Brilliance of the Sparrow. His work has appeared in numerous journals and has been recognized by the Minnesota State Arts Board and the National Poetry Series. Mauck lives in Minneapolis and teaches in the AFAN Creative Writing Program at Normandale Community College. If you're unable to purchase a copy today, he and his books can be found online online at, Ma uh, is this right, mauckmauck.com? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was a typo. Mauckmauck.com. Matt Mauck. One mouth was already taken, so I don't know. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> if I knew you needed readers, I would have lent you mine. Sorry, I found it too late. <laughs> Ptarmigan was my favorite P word, by the way. I love the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is so much learning how to be American. See how my steaming sandwich today is like a geyser. How my iced soda next to it exudes like a minor vent. Pardon me. Uh, hold on a second. I'm timing myself so I don't pull over. All right. Uh, see uh, how my iced soda next to it exudes like a minor vent. GPS reveals that I am just off I-29, not that from the dispenser, due to operator error, I grab so many more napkins than I'll need. In an older America, those who could used to read newspapers to those who couldn't, like chiefs. I remember a short recess from morning the week my grandfather died, locating and plucking the business and front page sections of the Sunday Des Moines Register. What I wanted was the sports. I had a Big Mac. I went from table to table, half wall to half wall, like a bee doing reconnaissance in a neighborhood where the flowers were few or it was too soon for them to bloom. Today, I scribble circles on a sheet of games for kids. It feels like I'm digging a hole for a tiny post which tiny people will use for something practical and good. I tell my pen that it's my regiment. I have been to Yellowstone, the Everglades, the Ozarks, the Great Salt Lake. I have not been to Niagara, Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, Waikiki, or the Alamo. I cover my big bills with ones and cover my ones with the fabric of my front right pocket as my grandfather did, my face like a carving at the apex of whatever I am. My wallet is a ruse. I study the profile on the top of a dime because my grandfather, before he lost the cancer weight, looked like that era of FDR. Today, I think that they both also look like a phase of Paul Bocuse, and that when I carry them in my pocket, I'm more robust. I have been to Mount Rushmore, to the top of the Empire State, to the Sunset Strip, the Smithsonian. 
The week my grandfather died, it was river people who rang the bell to give us food like we were the queen bee. Today I am reading the life and arts and front page sections of a Wall Street journal I picked like nectar from in front of a room I wasn't staying in. My grandfather read the Wall Street Journal every day. It arrived in the mail in Iowa a day late, which is too late for it to make you rich. <laughs> My grandfather drove a Lincoln Continental twice a year to play craps on the old Vegas Strip. It was he who taught me that my wallet should be a ruse. He said, let the pickpockets have it. He left so many other blanks. He was buried with red dice in his money pocket. I do not know what I would take with me, what it is that should mingle after the conflagration with my bone and ash. I have been to the French Quarter and within viewing range of the Golden Gate. Reading the WSJ, I insert myself into the story leads like a maid whose presence doesn't stop the couple who've rented the room from continuing. <laughs> All of us are drawing slowly from aquifers. The amber will be stuck in hardened so swiftly that we can't prepare a final pose. It catches some of us in our sleep. I unwrap what must be one of the last plastic straws in use. My fellow Americans are all on their phones learning at the speed of light. I add drops of my beverage to the paper that wrapped my straw and bring into life a tiny new mountain range. I add more drops and now the tiny mountain range looks like a backbone. I want to unzip myself and wrap around it. Your children are staring. I had thought that the fire was out. Um, so that's where the, from where the flown over. We come from flyover land. This book is about five months old, so it's pretty new, um, like most of the people reading today. Um, Uh, in this book, uh, I was kind of inspired by, by after the, the 2016 election when Donald Trump was elected, I wasn't inspired by that. Um, <laughs> after that election, there were so many people trying to explain why, why people from small towns, a lot of people in the Midwest, why all these people were responsible for Donald Trump's election. And I would read all these, these pieces, long magazine pieces, short news pieces. I read J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, and, and they all seemed to have, have uh, uh, motives. They all seemed to have agendas, things that they wanted to accomplish. And I, I grew up in a very, two very, very small towns, 10,000 people and then 3,000 people. Um, and, and I left those towns because those towns didn't give me what I was looking for, and I relocated to <coughs> cities. You know, and, and you know, there's that sort of, there's that movement, and there's an understanding of, of you know, the rural people, the urban people. And so I wanted to sort of capture both of those things as much as I could. And being in the middle of the country, fly over land, where the flown over, we come from fly over land. Um, there also happened to be a lot of vehicle poems, um, traveling poems in this book, probably because of that. So this is called The Post for the Classic Mopar Forum. Um, if you're not a car person, Mopar is, 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 is are Chrysler car parts. If you get a Chrysler car and you get car parts, they're called Mopar. So this is a post for the classic Mopar forum. At 81 miles per hour on interstate something or other, headed south, I tuned and tuned the radio dial. In a car, the vinyl seats of which and vinyl applique along each side and its hood medallion and bench seats were all emblazoned with a design based on the Aztec eagle. <laughs> Two or three hundred flocked around me, both cradling and leading. It was a kind of call and response, a nestling into, an autopilot. Tuning and tuning, I was trying to make a connection back to the old GE console that was as dominant in the living room I grew up in as a boxcar or as a mausoleum in New Orleans or Père Lachaise. 
a console in which the Beatles, et cetera, were interred, walking beheaded in profile. What I finally tuned in was an edition of myself swaying in front of the console in blue pants and a white shirt, muddied to the nipples like a reenactment of Chicken Little's Falling Sky. The road polyrhythmically was elevated and escorted me and itself was escorted by ditches to either side, earning rivers of their own. I was not driving but sailing. I was not sailing but sailed over. Beyond the evergreens, oil derricks may have been pumping. Graders may have been stripping the land. I was a water plant pretty and oblivious, 23 and broke, suitable for a marriage alliance, a fish on sacrifice day. Um, I was going to read some sort of small town poems and some city poems, and as I read through a lot of these, I realized I know the genesis of these poems, but you wouldn't know if they were small town poems or city poems necessarily, a lot of them, which kind of made me happy because that meant that I, I was accomplishing what I hoped to accomplish and didn't quite realize that I was. <laughs> so much precedes the end stop. It's no longer late at night. It's early in the morning. I am diaphanous, as milky and firm as sweet corn pre-boil. Ear witness to eight automobile tires arching their spines into concrete at an intersection 60 odd paces from my box seat, my still life. I reach for my shoes. A reflective yellow center line splits the hemispheres in my cranium. Mid reach, I become a freeze on a temple to a god of luck. This is during the transfer of momentum to the bodies. This is when a wave carries from my skull to the intersection, then back. This is my belief for three full seconds in escaping souls. This is road paint swallowing stop and go lights. It is the distillation of scream to sing. This poem starts with a joke. Person of interest one. How do we know that mosquitoes are religious? Person of interest two. They prey on you. <laughs> Brilliance that we can release into the wild. Genetically altered mosquitoes whose lethal infertility, say the scientist and attorney, will eradicate the species itself. Eradicating the species itself, say the scientists and attorney, is something we do knowing we are killing not the enemy, but the messenger. Annually killing the messenger would, sa would save the lives of 400,000 children, give or take, minus or plus. The war in which mosquitoes are the messengers is like the wars fought not by the conscripted, but by volunteers. For most, it is only the idea of war. While we are at war, we party, siesta, read, tend to our gardens. The Great War taught us how to do many discordant things. It is one of the spoils. We get it, some say, via DNA. Why then so few of us can dance as gracefully as our ancestors did? It has nothing to do with effort. I'm going to close with this poem. Um, when I was working on this book with my editor, he wanted a, he wanted he wanted a, another poem. He was looking for a different poem, and and I, I I'm one of those people. It's hard to write on cue like that to say, well, here you have the book. What's wrong with the poems that are in the book? Write me write another poem. So I was trying to figure out how to write another poem, 
and I came across uh, a, a new book at the time. So this is it's still a rather new book, Nebraska by Kwame Dawes. And uh, so Kwame Dawes is writing about being sort of a stranger, a foreigner in Nebraska, and, and I'm coming at this thing from a, the total opposite angle. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a, a person born here who grew up in these parts. I actually lived in Nebraska for a while, too. So I read his book, and I just got into it, and I read straight through, and I got to the end of it. I had been making notes in the margins. I wrote this poem, and so this poem is for Kwame Dawes, um, and I... I I think we should read our poems together sometime, Tommy and I. <laughs> so, this is called Slow Mo on the Morning of New Year's Eve at the End of the Year of the Jittery Heart. And this was written on the morning of New Year's Eve. Jittery Heart, is it that you have already said your say? You are quiet as the dead today, amidst the practicality of tree trimming. Winter like an x-ray revealing good bones and bad, which to keep for posterity, which for good luck to amputate, to stack and burn so we can think through smoke, common incense, common ceremony of the dead who seem yet to be steering. Like many practicalities, the tree trimming is also a politics, the limbs to be sacrificed over the property of one belonging to a tree rooted in the property of a neighbor next door, the bartering and quid pro quo that keep my neighborhood from war, not investigated, not recorded. My wish to know what I will never know is like being tossed about in a washing machine trying to see out the porthole. Only an hour ago, I was stuck like a car, the tires of which will only spin, in the happiness of eating a chicken egg fried in the fat of another animal, unaware that there would be eclipse after eclipse, as if waking itself were the magnitude event that the jittery heart, like a gyroscope, accounts for, so that we, like the athletes we watch on television, can regain and then maintain a balance, make the catch, stay in bounds, voila. <laughs> Thank you for listening. That was Matt Mauck. So once again, please recognize all four of tonight's speakers, Brian Satram, Phil Wallenholm, Chris Stark, and Matt Mauck. Thank you all for coming. Uh, next month, Thursday, September 9th, 7.30, uh, next, the next midstream reading, the host will be Don Brunkwell. I can't tell you if we will be here or back in virtual land. I, we've learned not to, well, you know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but I can tell you that the readers will be Marion Gomez, Siobhan Williams Shen, John Shank, and Brian Thawara. That's September 9th, 7.30. Thanks so much for coming. It's great to be back. Merlin's Rest. Join us if you can. <laughs> <laughs>